don't know if you know, but uh, there are some really strange laws that are still on the books uh, across this great land of ours in the United States of America. For instance, did you know it is illegal to sell pickles in Connecticut unless they bounce? You can check it out. Still a law on their books. I'm not sure they uh, fulfill that in many ways, but but it's true. It's illegal to sell pickles in Connecticut unless they bounce. That in Wisconsin, it is illegal to use margarine in public institutions. The great dairy state, right? Don't you dare use margarine in our schools, our prisons, and hospitals. In fact, I've heard it said, I don't know that this is actually a law, but in the restaurants, they have to serve you real butter unless you ask for margarine, but that's a whole other story. In Maryland, it is legal, it is illegal to swear while driving. (laughs) By your laughter, I know that's a serious issue, don't go to Maryland. In Berkeley, California, it is illegal to whistle for a lost canary before 7 a.m. There's a story there somewhere. I don't know what it is. Uh, Just because I have a a great fascination with Arkansas now that my son lives there, it is illegal in Arkansas to mispronounce the state's name. Just telling you. And so I want to make this personal. In Ohio, there's a few of you Ohio folks here. Uh, It is illegal to fish for whales on Sunday. It's literally on the books. I didn't know that there were whales in Lake Erie, but uh, it's, uh, it's illegal to go fish. Okay, tomorrow, Monday, go fish for all the whales you want, but not, not, on, not on Sunday. In PA, um, <laughs> you cannot shoot guns or fireworks at weddings. I'm just, I just I, hey, you guys, listen, right? You, you got a wedding coming up next summer. You're not allowed to shoot guns or fireworks. It's also illegal to catch fish with your mouth in the state of Pennsylvania. So make sure your fishing gear is all in store, right? I mean, I could go on because you know how much fun I could have with all of those things. Uh, But I think you get the point, right? There are a number of head scratching laws across the U.S. And likewise, you ready for this? Sometimes in the Bible, we come across some commands of God that just want to make us go, huh? Yeah, have you ever read through the Bible and read some of those like, what in the world is that there for? Right? So if you're just joining us this morning, you came on a really interesting morning. You should know that. Uh, you should know that we are taking also a very fast trip through the book of Exodus this fall. And the, the first half of the book was enthralling, right? Uh, it's the absolutely amazing story, the rescue of the people of God out of slavery in Egypt. But we have come... Now to the section of Exodus that gets preached a whole lot less. Like everybody loves to preach the Red Sea, right? The Ten Commandments, all those are good. But man, where we go today, not a lot of sermons going in Exodus 21 through 23. It's a very long and detailed explanation of a bunch of rules that God gives his people that are head-scratching. Right? Starting with the familiar Ten Commandments, but as we will see today, very quickly moves to some pretty strange laws for his people. I, I want to ask a question. How many of you have read the text for today in advance? Ooh, more hands than I anticipated. Very good. Good for you. Uh, how many of you didn't know that in the weekly email that Michelle sends out every Thursday, it gives the text that we're going to read for them? All right, so the rest of you who didn't raise your hands know what the text was, but desired not to read it. (laughs) Just just pointing that out. We already had confession. Hang on to that till next week, all right? Uh, uh, So so, uh, listen, if you happen to read the text for today, you you might come to church with a thousand questions. You, You might even come to church today a little angry, like, I can't believe the Bible says that. It is a rather strange set of verses. And unfortunately, the time that we have this morning will not address all of those questions. But listen, I I do hope that we see some very important, broad themes for us as the church today in these chapters. So turn in your Bibles. If you have them this morning, uh, you can take your own and turn to Exodus 21. If you do not, we've provided one for you in the pews in front of you, a black Bible there. It's on page 62 in your pew Bibles Exodus 21. As you turn there, let me remind you that, again, the first 20 chapters, God has miraculously rescued his people from slavery. 
They've been for over 400 years. He's led them, though, into the wilderness where he has had like amazing opportunity to show them his presence and his power. You might remember the Red Sea crossing, one of the many ways he provides for them in the wilderness by manna, quail. Last week, we saw him graciously yet powerfully reveal himself on Mount Sinai to give them the Ten Commandments. That, as we pointed out, that the people got to follow rather than had to follow. That's why they said, Lord, we will do all that you command. Well, today, as we make our way through chapters 21 to the beginning of 23, we see what might be called kind of the case studies of the grandiose law of the Ten Commandments, right? We're given that moral law, the Ten Commandments, those things uh, that you know that we've confessed through this morning. Thank you, Aaron. And, and, and now it's really important to, to see that what we run into today is kind of case studies of those. Like, for instance, this is how you should think about not stealing, right? Or not lying. Or not murdering, right? And I want you to remember that this case study of the law is being given to a million plus people who are wandering in a wilderness. I don't want us to lose sight of that, right? This is not suburban Pittsburgh that this law is given to. It's, it's a million plus people who are in the desert trying to figure out life. <laughs> right, right? So, and also, the very first ones who are reading it are, are people who've been in the wilderness for 40 years and they're about to go into the promised land and it should be on their heads. Like, how do we operate once we get there? Once we get there. And it's written to us as the church as well for a very special reason, a very specific reason as well. God starts with the words to Moses. If you're there in Exodus 21, he starts with these words to Moses. Now these are the rules that you shall set before them. I want to stop there. And you're thinking, man, it's going to take us a long time to get to chapter 23 if we go on one verse at a time. But I, I want to stop there, right? Because I I think it's a significant place to understand the context of all of what's going to be said in 21 through 23. God says, these are the rules that you shall set before them. That in the economy of God, here this people of God, in the economy of God, there are rules. There is, listen, a right way and a wrong way. Joe, are you going to preach for me today? You're good, man. I mean, I love to talk with you. I'm not telling you to stop. I'm just, I know you would if I gave you the invitation to. Right, you stay there. All right, so uh, there, there is a right way and a wrong way. That there is an absolute authority in the stratosphere of our lives that gets to determine that which is right and that which is wrong. And based Today, upon Exodus 21.1, I want to suggest that God is that authority. He says to Moses, here's the rules. He gets to make the rules. Now, this could be a philosophical discussion that is worthy of hours and hours of thought and discussion, right? I mean, we live in a culture that wants to tell us that the only absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. Absolutely. Right? Which you do understand disproves the very thing that they want to suggest. That they want to make an absolute about the fact that there are no absolutes. A little strange, right? It's called relativism. And at its core, it says that what is right for you may not be what is right for me. And the result is that we can decide for ourselves between right and wrong. And we all, pharisaical Christians, shake our heads at our relativistic culture and world and go, oh, I'm so glad I'm not like them. (laughs) But you are. So before we get all mad at our relativistic culture, right, before we get all mad at them, let's recognize that if we're honest, we all like to take an absolute right or wrong, an absolute of God and make it relative to what we want. In fact, I've had bugs in all of your houses all week. And you've all done this. 
but listen, the Apostle Paul confesses that he did it as well. Listen, I don't do what I know that I should do, and I do all the things that I shouldn't, and I justify it all. So even the Apostle Paul has fallen into this place of relativism. So much to say, but you get it, right? All of us, all of us love to adjust the absolutes of our lives in order to fit our desires. And my first point this morning is that as countercultural as it might be, and it is countercultural, that we as Christians must begin to get our heads around that there is an absolute truth, that there is an absolute right and wrong, and that God is the source of authority of that truth. So let's go back to Exodus. What, what has just happened to the people of God? They've been rescued, right, from slavery. They've been set free. We've been talking a lot about their freedom, right? They've been set free from a, a worldly power who controlled what they could and couldn't do. Egypt got to be the absolute truth, right? Egypt got to say, this is right and this is wrong. And now, finally, they've been set free. But listen, were they set free to self-rule? To self-autonomy, use a big old word for some of you smart people this morning. Do, do they now get to set up their own rules? No! Moses on the mountain, not only getting the Ten Commandments, but he's getting reams of case law of how they put those Ten Commandments into practice. Here in Exodus 21.1, now God says, these are the rules that you shall set before them. They have not been, listen, they have not been freed from slavery. They've just changed rulers. God told Moses as he prepared to set the people free, go and say to Pharaoh to let my people go. We like that part, right? Let my people go. Woohoo! Here we go. And he did. But you know that that's not the end of the statement. He says, go to Pharaoh and say to them, tell him, let my people go that they may serve me. The people of God are realizing that they've been rescued from the authority of Pharaoh, but they've been lovingly placed in the authority of their rescuer, of God. Not for self-law, but for God's law. And the point last week was that they were thrilled about that. We'll do whatever you say, God. And I think there's an important point of application here that we we need to capture for us today. That in the New Testament, Paul makes a very similar statement. Uh, look at Romans chapter 6 with me. It'll be on the screen. Romans chapter 6, verses 15 through 18. So Paul is talking about this idea of slavery. What then, he says, are, are we to sin because we are not under law but under grace? Oh, Paul says, by no means. Do, listen, do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness? In verse 17, thanks, oh, thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sin have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed, and having been set free from sin, listen, have become slaves of righteousness. Become slaves of righteousness. Look at the terminology that Paul uses to make sure that we get the point. If you're here today and you know that Jesus is your Lord and Savior, praise God, then know that Jesus has been your rescuer from sin and death. Praise God. But Jesus did not rescue you in order that you get to make up your own rules. So that you could go on sinning. No, he rescued you into his rules. Rules that give you life in place of death. That you are no longer slaves to sin, but are slaves to righteousness. Look in Exodus 21 to see how this works out in a really odd place. I want to talk about laws about slavery. Ready? That there's a right way and a wrong way to treat your slaves. Now understand, you Western 21st century people, 
that slavery in the Bible is not what we think of as 21st century Westerners who are reminded, as we should be, all the time of the atrocities, I say atrocities, of the slave trade and slavery in this country. In fact, this is such an important distinction that the ESV has made a comment about it in the preface of their Bible. In fact, we're not going to take the time this morning to summarize it for you, but just for sake of clarity, if you want to check me out, in the Pew Bibles, you can find it at the bottom of page Roman numeral 7, at the very beginning of your Bible in the preface. This is so important that the ESV in their preface has said, listen, that we may run into some words that in 21st century mean something very different than the reality of when they were presented in the scriptures. And slave, this Hebrew word of ebed, is one of those words. Listen, slave in the scriptures, as we see it here, could mean someone was in a really desperate place of poverty and could be taken on by another Hebrew to provide for him so he can get on his feet. So already here's some differences, right? The reality of the slave trade and what we experience in our history, our memorable history, right, is the reality that it was a different ethnic group, it was a different race, and, and right, there's all the atrocities came by virtue of our differences. In, in this text, we're not talking about a different people group, we're talking about Hebrews, Hebrews enslaving Hebrews. And one of the reasons that they would do that sometimes was out of grace. Because you have a Hebrew that can't afford to feed his family. But if he is enslaved by another Hebrew, he's provided for. That should give us a really different understanding of slave. Right? Doesn't stop there. Maybe in the case of females, and some of you ladies aren't going to like this, you can write your email to me later. Maybe in the case of females, a young girl is given in slavery in order for her to have the hope of a better life in a fellow Hebrew's household. Right? So in our text, if you've read it, you'll see, a, for instance, the reality that a young lady would be given in slavery in order to be a master's wife. But a father would do that in the hopes that she would indeed be a part of a family that could provide for her, that she would flourish in, and she would be blessed by. Another instance of slavery is that you volunteer to be a slave in order to repay the indebtedness or make restitution for a theft. Right? So, like... I'm, I'm indebted to Premier Bank. I pay a mortgage payment to them every month, right? If all of a sudden I couldn't make that payment, I, I might need to go over there and clean their offices, right? Take out their trash, wash the CEO's dishes. I, I don't know what I would do, right? But there's a reality that I could become a servant in order to pay off my debt. Bad example, but you get it, right? Or, or if indeed I, I stole from my neighbor and I couldn't pay him back, Right then I would be indebted to him in that way, and I could be a slave to him, a servant to him, in order to make restitution for the things that I've done that are wrong. You're getting the idea that slavery is very different than what our Western 21st century minds say and think. But these Hebrews, by virtue of this kind of slavery, still need clarification on a right and a wrong way to be a slave owner. Because, listen, the world around them is treating slavery in a very different way. Maybe more congruent with what we think of as slavery in the Western world in the 21st century. I mean, think about where Israel has just come from three months ago. Slavery mean cruel slavery to the Egyptians. God's saying, you're not to do it that way. There is a right way to do this. And this is what he's telling them in these verses. So how, how do we do slavery right? Well, this is what God is telling them in, in verses 2 through 6. So let me read it for you really quick. When you buy a Hebrew slave, he shall serve six years, and in the seventh he shall go out free for nothing. 
If he comes in single, he should go out single. If he comes in married, then his wife shall go out with him. If his master gives him a wife and she bears him sons or daughters, the wife and her children shall be her masters and he shall go out alone. That seems odd. Hold on. But if the slave plainly says, I love my master, I love my wife, I love my children, I will not go out free, then his master shall bring him to God and he shall bring him to the door or the doorpost and his master shall bore his ear through with an awl and he shall be his slave Forever, and it, it, it goes on, right? So, but here, it, this is not slavery that is forever. After serving six years, as a servant, as a slave, you're free to go. If you come in married, you get to leave married. If you have kids, even while you're there, you get to take your kids. But if you become married while you're there, then uh, you can't take her with you because she's actually a servant to the master. However... If you love your master and you love your wife and you love your kids, you can go out to the doorpost, right, and get an awl driven through your earlobe that says, I will be my master's servant. Years ago, sorry, this is an aside. Years ago, I had so many kids. This is so back in the 80s, right, that especially guys that wanted to get their ears pierced, this was their proof text. I'm going to belong to Jesus forever. So, Dad, you got to let me get my ear pierced. Bad interpretation of this text, right? Just sorry, kids, if that was your saying today. That's, that's, that's not going to work anymore. Listen, if a young woman is sold on, it goes on, if a young woman is sold to be a slave and the master doesn't want her, then she's to be redeemed, exchanged. But if she's given to a son, she has full family rights with all of their wealth. If another wife is added to the master, master can't take privileges away from her. If a master, listen, if a master strikes and kills a slave, then the master must die as well. If a slave is struck and loses an eye or a tooth, then he goes free. I, I know that for our culture, this still sounds a bit crazy, maybe to some of you, a bit sexist, but what we must understand is that the law of God is given, listen, to protect and to preserve by giving us a right way of doing things. <sighs> Kevin DeYoung says, it is obvious that God is not condemning slavery here, but he's also not commending it. Instead, he is constraining it. Slavery has been abused in the culture of the Hebrews, and God is saying, no longer, not for you. There is a right way of doing this. And if you follow this into the New Testament, you'll see that the idea of slavery is changing altogether. Eventually, as we saw in Romans 6, the idea of slavery moves entirely from being a physical thing to being a spiritual thing. But there is here in Exodus a right and a wrong given by God to protect his people. And so it is for the remainder of these verses here. And here that as there is a definitive right and wrong, that this is why the law is necessary. So second overarching thought this morning, first is this, that there is a right and wrong. God gets to make it. It's for our good. And in that, the law is necessary. If we acknowledge that there's a right and wrong, then, then we might ask, how are we to know what that right and wrong is? And this is the value of the law. A good and gracious God who has rescued us is willing to tell us now how to live. The law in the Old Testament takes three forms. This is a bit uh, academic, maybe, for you. Some of you probably already know this, right? The law in the Old Testament takes three forms. There's the moral law. Think of the Ten Commandments, right? All the thou shalt not, the things that we confess through today. There's the ceremonial law. Those are the Sabbath rules, all the festival rules, the things that you that had to do within the context of worship. And then there was the civil law. How it is that as a community, we interact with each other. And the question is, is how are these things still applicable to us today? And there are books written about the reality of this. I'll, I'll give you the cliff notes. Are you ready? The moral law is still applicable, right? You read the Ten Commandments, right? Uh, and, and that is still the law for us as God's people. In fact, if you flip to Matthew 5, which we will this morning in just a moment, 
you'll see that Jesus takes the moral law and, and he, he resets it even in its most uh, appropriate and right manner, right? By saying, hey, I, I know it says not to murder and you all think that means taking another one's life, bang, but the reality of murder is even being angry at your brother, right? And it begins to reset. So that moral law, Jesus is saying, is very relevant, really real, right? Things that we should pay attention to. How about the ceremonial law? Does that, does that carry over? Well, uh, the reality is, is that uh, there's significance to it. Is it important? Yes, it's important. But it doesn't carry over. We, we, we don't do ceremonial law before you come. We don't make you wash, right, before you come into worship. We, we, we don't ask that when you sin that you bring a lamb so that we can sacrifice it here at the front, blood all over the place, right? We, we don't do those things. Why? Because all of those ceremonial laws have been fulfilled in Christ. He's become the one who has made us pure. He's the one who's become the Lamb of God. He, he fulfills that sermon. So it's not that it's not important. It's just that it's fulfilled by Christ. Now, here's the hard one. Civil law. How many of you love bacon? Right? I, I'm a big bacon lover, right? And we, do, should we stop eating bacon? Because like, if you, can, you can find it in here, right? The bacon's not something you shouldn't be eating the pig. So is, are, are those things applicable to today? Well, I'm going to tell you this. No. Whoo, you bacon lovers go, yes, that's great. But are they important? Yes. And they're important because even these civil laws, though they are not transferable, right, to us as being prescriptive, there are things that they describe that we need to pay attention to. So I'm going to really quickly try to do those three things. First, the law reveals... That life is precious. Therefore, justice is necessary. Look really quickly at verses 12 through 19 in chapter 21. And these are hard. Whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. But if you did not lie and wait for him, but God let him fall into his hand, then I will appoint for you a place to which he may flee. But if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Whoever strikes his father or his mother shall be put to death. You parents say, amen. I, I, you take that one. Wait a minute, I can't apply that? Nuts. All right, whoever steals a man and sells him, sort of like 21st century or, or 19th century slavery that we all know, so whoever steals a man and sells him, and anyone found in possession of him, he shall be put to death. Whoever curses his father or his mother shall be put to death. Listen. Those are hard things, especially if you're like a non-capital punishment guy, right? Or lady here this morning, right? It just sounds harsh. But what, what is the descriptive? Remember, not prescriptive. It's not saying that we have to do this, right? So if your child curses you out today, uh, you don't have to bring the church. We stone him, he dies, right? We, you don't have to do that. But there is descriptive reality to those things that says this. Life is precious. If you take a life... Your life will be taken. Life is precious. I mean, it's clear that in the context of a million people wandering in the wilderness, that God is making it clear that there will be immediate consequences for taking a life because life is precious. Every life is made in the image of God and is precious to God. We do not have the right to take the life of another, whether that is the life of an unborn child, whether that is the life of an aging adult, or the life of someone that we feel is less than us, or one that has offended us or hurt us. In fact, the only time that is permitted to take a life is when that individual has taken a life himself. Life is precious. Therefore, for Israel, justice for taking a life is swift and severe. And it points us to another helpful theme in these verses. Second, justice demands that the punishment fits the crime that the punishment fits the crime. Look at verses 22 through 25 in chapter 21. When men strive together and hit a pregnant woman so that her children come out, but there is no harm, the one who hit her shall surely be fined as the woman's husband shall impose on him, and he shall pay as the judges determine. Crazy stuff, isn't it? But if there is harm, then you shall pay life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, Foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound. Get it? Stripe for stripe. Punishment must fit 
the crime. How many of you have heard of this principle of an eye for an eye, right? That, that if somehow we believe that in the Old Testament that God is saying, if, if you take an eye, then your eye gets taken. Again, not prescriptive, but descriptive. It's mentioned several times in the Old Testament, and you may know that Jesus actually talks about it in the New Testament. The Sermon on the Mount, I said, what does Jesus say? Glad you asked. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Anybody have roast in the crock pot? Because we're going to be long today. Just letting you know. Matthew 5, 38 through 42. It's important stuff. I think it's on the screen. You have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I say to you, do not resist the one who is evil. But if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn to him the other. And if anyone would sue you, take your tunic and let him have your cloak as well. And if anyone forces you to go one mile, go with him two miles. Give to the one who begs from you, and do not refuse the one who would borrow from you. So you want to say, what is it? Is it Exodus 21, eye for an eye, right? You do this to me, I get to do this to you. Or Jesus' word of, wait a minute, this is shifted. Well, listen, it's not shifted. Jesus is just redefining. But even in the Old Testament, it didn't actually mean that you get to, if your eye came out, you get to take somebody else's eye out. In fact, even in Exodus 21, it says if you injured a slave's eye, you didn't get to take the master's eye out. It's just the slave goes free. Jesus is refining. He's saying, listen, the reality of this is that the, the punishment must fit the crime. The civil law for Israel is not a direct correlation for civil law for us, but there is a principle here that is helpful that's really still a great part of our legal system today. Why does God say an eye for an eye to Israel in Exodus 21? Well, the cultures around them, listen, and maybe even within the camp of the Hebrews, there has become a practice of a head for an eye rather than an eye for an eye. (laughs) Right? That retribution has not been a fair restitution. Let me say that again. That retribution has not been a fair restitution, but an escalating vengeance. That if you steal a cow from me, well, I'm coming to burn down your barn. Right? I don't know if you've ever seen this in modern day culture. Somebody cuts you off, so now I'm going to like chase you down and bust in your windshield. That's not an eye for an eye. Not a tooth for a tooth or a burn for a burn. The reality in Israel's time is that there was vengeance happening in this camp of a million people in a wilderness. Somebody's doing something, they're doing twice as bad to them. So what is God saying? Moses, listen, here's the rules that I'm giving you. The punishment has to fit the crime. You don't get to escalate. This might be good for your marriage too, right? In the reality of... uh, (laughs) <laughs> my wife thought, well, I'm going to do this, well, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this. We, we just keep escalating, right? And that never gets us anywhere. So God is saying here, you don't get to add to it, but there is restitution. Verses 21, 28 through 32, I won't read it for you. Uh, you can read it later. There is an obvious problem with wild oxes goring people. If that doesn't make you go home over lunch and want to read it, I don't know what will, right? God is establishing, though, in this restitutive ways to deal with that. It also seems, unsurprisingly, that theft is an issue in the camp of Israel. So God declares a system of restitution. In 22, verses 5 through 6. Uh, let's read that one. Ready? 22, 5 through 6. If you're still open in Exodus. If a man causes a field or a vineyard to be grazed over or or lets his beast loose and feeds in another man's field, he shall make restitution from the best in his own field and in his own vineyard. If a fire breaks out and catches in thorns so that the stacked grain or the standing grain or the field is consumed, he who started the fire shall make full restitution. Hear the word, restitution, restitution, restitution. This is the eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. Listen, when your neighbor's cow comes over and eats your field, you, you don't... There's a way to make this right. And that's what God is saying. Don't allow conflict to escalate, but allow the consequence, the punishment, fit the crime. You can't take a head for an eye 
as you might be accustomed to doing. Rather, the punishment has to fit the crime. Third, some of you are glad we finally made it to three. Justice, listen, justice resets responsibility. Here's the name of the sermon title, right? There's rescue. Here's what God is doing. He's resetting. He's using the law to reset the Hebrew's mind. And the reset is this. Love your neighbor. The reason he gives the law is not so that you have some dogmatic way of necessarily treating all these things, but I think the the foundation of the reality of the law is, listen, you can avoid all of these things if you just love your neighbor. Look at 22, verses 21 through 27. Important text. It says, you shall not wrong a sojourner or oppress him, because you were sojourners in the land of Egypt. You shall not mistreat any widow or fatherless child. If you do mistreat them and they cry out to me, I will surely hear their cry, and my wrath will burn, and I will kill you with a sword, and your wives shall become widows and your children fatherless. If you lend money to any of my people with you who is poor, you shall not be like a money lender to him, and you shall not exact interest from him. If ever you take your neighbor's cloak and pledge, you shall return it to him before the sun goes down, for that is his only covering, and it is his cloak for his body, and what else shall he sleep? And if he cries to me, I will hear, for I am compassionate. You you hear that? Moses is on the mountain. God's saying, listen, yeah, there's ways for restitution. There's ways for, but here's here's the underarching theme. Just love one another. After God sets the standard that we are to put sorceresses to death, which he does earlier in this, and that we're not to lie down with animals, that's in verse 19, crazy random things, he moves to a whole section here that I think becomes the point of the law as a whole. The reason we have consequences to mistreating people is to emphasize the principle that we are to love others, even our enemies. And let's wrap up here. Somebody say amen. Thank you. And consider that the greatest takeaway, right, that we might have in these odd verses is the final point today, that love is actually the goal. Love is the goal. Do you remember what Jesus told the Pharisee who pressed in with the question of the greatest commandment in the law? Matthew chapter 22, I think it will be on the screen. Here, I'll read it on the screen. Matthew 22. When the Pharisees heard that he had silenced the Sadducees, they gathered together, and one of them, a lawyer, asked him a question to test him. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And he said to him, Jesus said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And this is the great and first commandment, and a second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend, listen, <laughs> All of the law. The moral law, the ceremonial law, and the civic law. All of the law and the prophets hang on this. Love God and love one another. The foundation of the law is that we might learn to love. Maybe a drop mic moment, right? Maybe a simple but clear answer to why these weird laws are in the Bible. Not so that we might be consumed with goring bulls, but rather be consumed with loving one another. And is this not the story of the gospel? Is this not the story of Jesus? Do you hear it in this? Our lives created by God are precious to God. And so when it is apparent, right, that we cannot keep the law and we become slaves to sin... Jesus becomes our restitution, our redeemer, the one whose life is given in exchange for ours. Listen, the punishment has to fit the crime, and the crime for Stoffer is that he's dead in his sins. But Jesus, oh, but Jesus has died for me. He's made restitution because way before Stoffer could love him, He loved Stoffer. Way before you could love Jesus, Jesus loved you. Love is the goal. 
And we do that now as slaves to righteousness. Jesus did not rescue us so that we could argue with him about his law, but so that we might become slaves to a different authority than our sin and be slaves to righteousness. So what's the main application here to us as the church? (laughs) What would Moses' proverbial word be to the church today? What would be our reset? Maybe, maybe it'd be a case study of loving the visitor who comes to church and sits in your spot. Rather than standing over them saying, "Uh, excuse me, sir, this is where I sit. Maybe a command, right, listen, to expose the gospel by loving one another. Christ said, this is how they will know you are Christians. By your love. Listen, maybe even a directive of even loving our enemies. Of loving people who aren't like us. Taking care of the poor. Taking care of our community. Uh, the, the Lord, through Moses, has an amazing message for his people at the base of Mount Sinai. He says, I'm going to build my kingdom through you, and this is how. And he gives them the law. Likewise, God says to us today, I'm going to build my kingdom through covenant church. And he gives us the command today to love one another as he has loved us. I know this, absolutely. God loves you. I know this as well. He has provided a way for us to love one another, to love our community, our neighborhoods, to love the world. He has provided a way for us to love one another. Hear this. May we build his kingdom in doing so.